Hey everyone, this is KubeCon and Cloud Native Con North America 2021. And this session is about what you need to know before using local persistent volumes on Kubernetes. My name is Sebastian. Most people call me Seb, so you can just do that. I'm a software engineer at Elastic, um, where I mostly work on our Kubernetes operator for the Elastic stack that we call ECK, as in Elastic Cloud on Kubernetes. So on the agenda today, we'll mostly talk about local volumes and uh, basically start with explaining how they work and how things uh, are plugged together in the Kubernetes world. Then we'll mention how you can provision those local volumes in different ways. And finally, I think the most important part of this presentation is going to be the last part about what I call operational gotchas, which is basically a list of things you need to pay attention to to ensure you are using your local volumes and especially your stateful workloads along with them the right way. So let's get started. How do things work? What are persistent volumes at all? So usually when we talk about persistent volumes, we associate that concept with the stateful set concept, which is a way to deploy stateful workloads in Kubernetes. So let's take an example here. On, on the left in that uh, pink box, I'm deploying a stateful set with three replicas. And let's imagine this is an Elasticsearch cluster, but it could really be any sort of distributed database in this example. And in this stateful set, I'm, I'm specifying that I want 100 gig of storage per pod. So the stateful set controller in turn will create three pods because I, I want three replicas. So the first pod is going to be with ordinal number zero, ordinal number one, and then we have another one, the last one with ordinal number two. And because I requested a claim of 100 gigabytes, each of these pods is going to be associated to a persistent volume, so a storage unit of 100 gigabytes. And the nice part about the stateful set and the persistent volume concept is that we have a direct the direct one-to-one -one relationship between the pod and a persistent volume here. So for example, this pod, my ES cluster zero is associated to this persistent volume called data my ES cluster zero. This property is very nice because whenever, for example, that pod number two gets deleted, either on purpose because we want to upgrade it or either accidentally, then the relationship with its volume stays intact. So here, the stateful set controller would just recreate that missing pod for the stateful set, and that pod will automatically be associated to the same persistent volume. So that's a very nice way to treat stateful workloads, because whenever you need to, like, for example, upgrade the version of that database or do a change in the configuration, you'd basically roll out the pods one by one. And when the restart those pods, stay bound to the same volume and stay bound to the same data. So there's no data loss associated to that operation, which makes it very nice. So if you get into more details, you all know Kubernetes is all about YAML resources, right? So let, let, let's take a look at this uh, specifications. So on the left, we had our stateful set with three replicas. That's what we have here. It has a name, my ES cluster. ES has an elastic search, but the game could be anything. And I specify a volume claim template so that each of the pods of the stateful set has a particular persistent volume with here 100 gigabytes. In turn, the stateful set controller reads that resource and is going to create for each pod, the pod itself, of course, along with an associated persistent volume claim. So we have the pod, the pod here in the top and the persistent volume claim here at the bottom. And really the claim itself is not really the volume yet. It's just, it just expresses the desire for the pod to acquire a storage unit, which is gonna be the persistent volume. So at this point, we have a pod, we have a claim. And the pod is basically waiting for that claim to be bound to a real volume. And you can see that there's a, a very nice naming convention in, in, in all that system. So the stateful set here that is called my ES cluster uh, determines the name of the pod. So the first pod is gonna be my ES cluster zero. 
And the persistent volume claim is going to reuse that name of the pod, when he has cluster zero, but prepend to it the name of the volume claim that we declared in the stateful that is also used in the, in the pod definition itself. So we have this, this relationship between the naming of all that stuff. So there's some sort of implicit relationship between those. Now we have this claim saying, I want 100 gigs of storage. And what usually happens, and we'll see it's not always the case, but if you, for example, um, create a stateful set or your persistent volume claim um, on the cloud provider, what's usually going to happen is that a provisioner, an external thing, an external controller is going to provision a volume that matches the claim. So you want 100 gig volume expressed in that claim and something external, the provisioner is going to, going to create that volume for you, right? And that volume is here, for example, um, a persistent disk in, in uh, BCP. And it's going to be the same size as the claim you requested. So now we have persistent volume on one hand, persistent volume claim on the other hand, and the, the volume was created especially for that claim. And, and the next step is for another controller in Kubernetes, which is called uh, the PPC controller, to bind the volume and the claim together. So whenever there's a claim, that controller will look for any available volume that can match that claim. And in our case here, in this example, the volume was created just to match the claim. So it's very easy for that controller to bind the two together. And again, here, there's a, a relationship between those two that we can inspect in the YAML file. Like here, we see that um, in the volume, we have a reference to a particular claim. So that's the claim um, that was bound to that volume. So it has the same name here as our claim on the left. And we also see that the, the claim itself was updated with the name of the volume to which it is bound. I usually like to separate two categories of volumes. Um, the first one, which is local volume, local volume, which is really what all this uh, presentation is about, versus the second one, which I like to call network attached volumes. And usually, if you try out uh, persistent volumes in a cloud provider or you try out stateful sets with those volumes, you'll usually get the default type of volume, which is pretty often a network attached volume. And there are a lot of different implementation of those network attached volumes. Um, and that's what you get by default, usually, depending on your Kubernetes provider. So there's always a trade off between the choice. Like you can choose whether you want to use network attached volumes or local volumes. And, and there's a big trade off, and it's a, a lot of research to do in order to make sure you understand the trade-off here. Um, but basically it all comes down to the performance you need from that volume. Um, of course, if you use a locally attached NVMe SSD volume to the VM, you're gonna get much better performance than if you mount a file system using the network. Although uh, the performance of those network attached volumes is getting better and better. It's also possible that the, the price is very different. Like you, you may get a cheaper, volume by using the, the local um, hard disk directly rather than paying for the units of storage you use over the network. Uh, but again, this depends on, on your provider. Another big difference is that um, those local volume are usually not there by default when you deploy Kubernetes. You probably have to provision those yourself or to install a provisioner so you get access to those local volumes. And that's what we're going to see next. But really, the main difference between those two is that a local volume is really bound to a particular host since it directly matches a physical disk like that is plugged to that virtual machine um, that volume can only exist on that particular host and it's a big difference because on the other hand when you use network attached volume you could simply delete your pod your workload and that pod could be recreated anywhere with the same volume because the same volume can be attached over the network again, which makes things much simpler for operations. Whereas local volumes need to be operated with this constraint in mind that they are bound to a particular host and, and this host cannot change for a given volume. So how does this, this work in practice? Well, it's just using the affinity mechanism of Kubernetes, the same you would use for example, to um, stick a particular pod to a particular subset of nodes in your Kubernetes cluster. So here, for example, in this local persistent volume, we see that there's a local path defined. So that's really directory on the file system um, onto which this volume is mounted. 
an infinity. And here, this affinity setting, um, I'm, I'm using a GKE cluster here, specifies that this volume can only exist on a host with that particular name here, right? So whenever the scheduler schedules a, a new pod and that pod um, is associated to a persistent volume claim, which itself is bound to a persistent volume, then the, the pod itself can only be scheduled on the same host as the persistent volume. So how can you make use of those volumes yourself? You have to provision them because they are not likely not just there by default. So I think there are in general three different ways to provision those volumes. The first one, which I call manual provisioning, where you basically want to create that persistent volume resource yourself, like write a YAML file, create a resource for that volume. Then what I call static provisioning, where you run to run a program or an agent on each host that will automatically discover the disks that are available on a given host and create the corresponding volumes automatically. So for example, if you have a virtual machine with three different hard disks attached, you could run this tool to automatically create three different volumes of the same size as the disk. That's static provisioning. And in, in both those cases, manual provisioning and static provisioning, you usually create the volumes of the size you want in advance, and then the pods and stateful sets, et cetera, you create can make use of those available volumes. Whereas this third category, dynamic provisioning, allows um, a controller, so it's usually a controller, like you run an, act, an additional controller or operator in your Kubernetes cluster, um, this controller is responsible for automatically creating the persistent volumes on demand, depending on the claims that were created. So if you, if you work with dynamic provisioning, you have no volume at first, but as soon as you create a workload that claims, for example, 100 gigs of storage, then this dynamic provisioner is going to provision and create a volume of 100 gigs of storage. So really three different ways, going from the simplest on the left to the more complex on the right. So let's take a look at manual provisioning and how you can create a persistent volume yourself. Well, basically it's just a YAML file. Like you just create this persistent volume resource, you give it a name, you specify its capacity, and you um, sort of indicate the path in the file system that you want to use for that volume. So you need to be careful here that the capacity you advertise in the spec technically doesn't have to match the real capacity you have on the file system. Like you could very well declare a volume of 100 gig of storage here, but behind the scenes, that, that file system is actually one terabyte of storage. And there's nothing that is going to block you from doing that. And nothing is going to prevent you from, for example, using 500 gigabytes instead of the, the, the advertised 100 gigabytes of storage, because that, that file system behind the scenes is much larger than that. Nothing is going to check that size, so be careful. And of course, you want to define the node affinity to make sure that particular volume belongs to that particular host. And basically, that's it. Just apply that YAML file and create that local volume. And this volume can then be bound to a claim as soon as you create the claim that matches the volume. So as you see, that's very much of like a lot of manual work that is required that you can script, of course, to create all those volumes in advance. But what's maybe smarter to do if you know that you want to run a particular stateful workload on your Kubernetes cluster is to auto automatically create the volumes that uh, correspond to the disks you have on each virtual machine. And there's a very useful tool maintained by um, the Kubernetes special interest group um, the, the storage special interest group, which, which is called the local persistent volume static provisioner. And really this is some sort of daemon set that runs on your Kubernetes cluster that is going to inspect on each host the partitions and disks that are available on the file system of the host. And for example, if that tool sees that there are five disks that it could use, it's going to automatically create five different persistent volumes matching those disks. So you basically just install the tool and after a few seconds, you have all the persistent volumes that are available uh, matching the disks you have. So it's very useful if you sized your machines and their disks according to the workload you expect to have in the future. And finally, maybe the more advanced way to provision 
uh, local volume is to use dynamic provisioning. So you have a lot of options there. I'm just going to mention two of them that I find interesting. The first one is the ZFS uh, CSI driver of OpenEBS, which allows you to provision volume based on a ZFS file system, which is created on demand for the exact size that is required in the claim. And the second one is called Topo LVM. It's actually very similar in nature, except that instead of um, provisioning volumes based on ZFS, it's going to provision volume based on LVM and then format those volumes as you desire. So both allow you to kind of the same thing, right? And really with this dy dynamic provisioning, it's more about creating the right volume of the right size automatically whenever a user requests a particular volume of a specific size. So it's much more dynamic and you can do much more advanced things. Like for example, on a given host, you could build a red out of 10 disks and then out of those 10 disks, a, a smaller or maybe 10 smaller volumes are going to be created with different sizes. All right, so now that you know a bit more about what system volumes are, what local system volumes are, especially, and, and how you can provision them, let's look at how we deal with operations. And actually, you'll understand why using local system volumes can be much more difficult to operate than um, network attached volumes. So this part of the presentation is becoming more complicated, so I included an animated GIFs uh, to make it more entertaining. <laughs> so we're going to look here at a list of cases and see how the system would behave with, with local system volumes. So let's take the host failure case. So we have the same example here with a stateful set with three replicas. And say the host here, node C, that is holding the workload of, of the second, so this part number two, so really the third replica, but ordinal number two, suddenly becomes pending. Like the pod cannot be started on that host again. And the reason is that that host is dead, like it's unavailable, it's disconnected from the fleet entirely. Maybe the virtual machine was like completely recycled and you cannot make use of it anymore. Let's assume it's completely unrecoverable and the data also itself is completely unrecoverable. There's no way you can get it back um, and, and bind it to a new bot. So usually when you use stateful set for distributed workloads, distributed database, um, there's some kind of replication system where the different members of that distributed workload are able to replicate their data all around. So here, chances are, if you configure it properly, that all the data that used to be in that volume is also replicated somewhere else on another volume. Like we can imagine we have several chunks of data there that are, that are replicated to at least another member of the system. And that's fine. It's very useful. It's a property of the application you run. And this way, losing a single member of your stateful workload doesn't cause the total loss of availability or, or the data loss of, of your um, storage, basically. So when that happens, you'd like the system to sort of recover automatically, right? That's what uh, Kubernetes is supposed to do. Like, say, you run a deployment. If one pod is killed, Kubernetes is going to recreate another one automatically. But with stateful sets, and especially with local volumes, it's more complicated. You'd really want that pod to be recreated automatically on that uh, node D here. That's not happening. And the reason is that that pod is bound to a volume that is bound to a particular host. And even though that host is now dead, there's nothing that is going to change that relationship. So the pod is going to stay pen. So you could say, well, that's easy. Let's just delete that pod. And then Kubernetes is going to recreate it again. But, but, it, but it doesn't work because the pod is going to be recreated, bound to the same claim, which itself is bound to the same volume, and that volume is bound to a particular host. So in the end, the pod is going to be scheduled on that particular host that doesn't exist anymore. So it doesn't work. What you really have to do here is first delete the claim and then delete the pod. So there's no pod anymore and there's no claim anymore. So the stateful set controller is going to recreate that new pod, but it's also going to recreate a new claim. And that claim is going to be bound to a different new volume. So here, that's a really a way to 
start fresh with a new pod, with a new volume. And then you can rely on your application to replicate and recover the data the way it's supposed to do. Be careful here that there's, there's a small race condition when you delete PVC and pod in, in older versions of Kubernetes. Uh, what could happen is that you delete the PVC, then you delete the pod, but that pod gets recreated before the PVC deletion is complete. So the pod will still be waiting and pending because it's bound to that PVC that you deleted afterwards. So you may need to delete the pod twice actually to make it work again. But that's fixed in the recent version of Kubernetes. Just, just upgrade your version. <laughs> Um, so you see here that Kubernetes is not really optimizing for us the way to recover this missing um, member of our stateful workload. Even though all the primitives out there, there's still some sort of manual action required to acknowledge the loss of the persistent volume claim, delete the pod and let it be recreated normally. And of course, this can be automated because maybe you don't want to be woken up in the middle of the night because just one host failed out of your 50 nodes cluster. And you'd rather want that, that um, pod to be recreated somewhere else and recover its data normally. So what you could do here is write a small script or a small controller that you deploy in Kubernetes. And that, that controller would basically just watch the Kubernetes node resources. And whenever there's a change on any of the nodes, like you could indicate that one of the nodes is suddenly unavailable, what you could do is list the existing persistent volume claim and check if one is on one of those failed dead nodes. And if that's the case, then you just remove that volume, remove the pod, and both are gonna be recreated somewhere else automatically. And this can be made automatically. You should note that here, it's important to distinguish between a host that would be completely dead and unrecoverable, as in there's no chance ever that the same pod is gonna run with the same data on that host. It's over, it's done, not possible. In which case you really want to recreate it somewhere else. Versus a case where there's a chance you can recover the data and you can recreate that pod on the host. Like say, for example, someone just restarted the virtual machine. And after a few seconds, we know that the virtual machine is going to come back. So that pod is going to be started again with the same volume that is still there. So you really need to differentiate those two cases. And I think one useful way to do that is to consider that if, if a node is completely out of the fleet, you might as well set up a process to remove that node resource from Kubernetes. So that small automation here, we just have to check whether the node exists or not in the API. And if it doesn't, then you know you can safely remove PVC and pod. However, if you just, um, for example, check the healthness, the, the health of that pod, then chances are maybe it's going to come, come back later. So you need to be really careful about distinguishing those two cases. Let's take another example where we don't have a sudden failure of one host, but rather we know we want to take out one particular host away from the fleet. And a good use case for that is Kubernetes version upgrades. What people tend to do because it's simpler is to treat all the Kubernetes nodes as immutable. So whenever you want to upgrade the Kubernetes version rather than upgrading the Kubelet in place on the same machine, you'd rather spin up a new virtual machine and decommission the old virtual machine, right? So the way people usually do that is spin up that new VM, drain the, the node that you don't want anymore. The drain really translates to marking that node as unschedulable, so no new pod can be scheduled on it. It also it translates to deleting all the pods that are living on that node so that Kubernetes can reschedule those pods elsewhere. An interesting property um, and feature of Kubernetes is to combine this drain concept with the pod disruption budget. So the pod disruption budget is another Kubernetes resource that you create in advance where you specify how many pods of the same workload you allow to be taken down at the same time. For example, here, if you have an Elasticsearch cluster with three pods, it can be very useful to create a pod disruption budget where you would specify that you only allow one pod to be taken out of the fleet at one time. So you're sure that that drain command is not going to delete two pods at once of the same Elasticsearch cluster, right? So once that's done, once you have no more pod running on that host, you would 
have again, as we've seen before, to delete both the PVC and the pod. So the pod was already deleted, but you also need to delete the PVC to make sure that this pod can be recreated somewhere else with a new fresh volume. And then relying on the replication achieved by the application itself, you sort of recover your workload and you didn't lose availability and you didn't lose data. So that's what we have here with this, this red box representing a, a node that is being um, trained. And um, before that, we replace that node with a new node using the new Kubernetes version. Now, unfortunately, things are not that easy. So first we've seen that someone, something needs to delete the PVCs because that's not done automatically, right? And usually if you enable the automatic version upgrade of cloud providers, they're going to do the drain mechanism automatically without you uh, required to do something on the computer. But that, that mechanism is definitely not going to delete the persistent volume claim. So this is something you have to plan for. The other important thing and important limitation of those automated version upgrades is that it's very common for the pod disruption budget to be respected for a very short amount of time. So short being something like 60 minutes in GKE, for example. So you, you may think 60 minutes is big enough for most workloads, but say you have an Elasticsearch cluster and each node in that cluster is holding maybe five or 10 terabytes of data it's possible that 60 minutes is not enough to migrate all that data over the network to the other pods, right? And because that pod disruption budget is not respected anymore after this, this, this hour, this 60 minutes, then the upgrade system is going to move on to the next pod. And this is where you can lose availability of your data or even worse, uh, lose the data entirely because the application may not have enough time to recover from the deleted pod, recover the data, like replicate the data from the other members to the new member in the system. That's very dangerous. So what you should rather do instead, and the safest option would be to manually create this new node pool with a new Kubernetes version and make sure that you migrate your workload here, right? So you trigger a data migration, like uh, change the affinity rules for the new pods to live on that new node pool. And then finally, since there should be no pod anymore on the, on the old node pool, you would delete the old node pool, right? But that, that's much more custom. And really, when you use local volumes with a lot and a lot of data, chances are this automated Kubernetes cluster upgrades from cloud providers won't be good for you. So the problem with this, with this mechanism is that it, it really relies on the fact that you delete one pod at a time and then let this pod be recreated fresh with a new volume somewhere else and rely on the application itself to replicate the data there. But this is some sort of planned maintenance, right? Like you know you're going to remove that pod and it's a bit sad to sort of rely on the mechanism to uh, of, of failover of the data, like of recovery of the data for something you know is going to happen. And even worse, what if at the same time with this planned maintenance, you get another unplanned disruption, like another host dies, for example. Suddenly you have two pods that are taken down at once. And this is where you could get potential availability loss or data loss, which could be dangerous. And actually we'd be in a better place if we could just, be, instead of deleting the pod and recreating it, somewhere else afterwards, first create an additional replacing pod, migrate the data there, and then remove the old pod. But unfortunately, that's very hard to do with stateful sets because stateful sets have this concept where they use an ordinal for each pod. And here, if we have pod zero and pod one, if we want to get rid of pod zero, what maybe we'd like to do is create pod number two, migrate the data there, and then delete pod number zero. And that's it, and we're left with pod number one and two. But in practice, that's not possible. Stateful sets don't work like that. They work the opposite way. They work with the assumption that we, we delete the pod and then recreate them rather than um, what is closer to the deployment resource where you do a rolling upgrade by creating new pods first and then progressively deleting the old pods. So I haven't found a good solution to that problem yet with the stateful sets. Like some people manage pods directly, um, some people just 
can't do that. So another thing you could do is increase the number of replicas. So here we suddenly have three replicas, which is nicer. And then we remove that pod zero, but then it's going to be recreated. So if we want to get back to zero replica, we have to like scale down to two rep, sorry, to two replicas to delete that pod again. So we end up with some sort of double data migration where we first migrate the data to that new pod. And then once the old pod is, is gone and recreated, we migrate back. So that's double data migration. That's not very useful. No good solutions to that. There's an interesting project from the Open Cruise team that is called the clone set and adv advanced stateful sets as well that sort of um, give more features to the stateful set with the new CRD to do things like that, but nothing built in the stateful sets, unfortunately. Another thing I wanted to warn you about is about what I call concurrent stateful set upgrades and concurrent pod scheduling at the same time. So here, say we have a stateful set with two pods. What could happen is that you do an upgrade to the spec of that stateful set. And when that happens, pods are deleted, then recreated with a new spec one by one, and they, make, they rely on the same volume so you preserve the data. So first the pod is deleted, then it's recreated on the same host because there's still this constraint, constraint that it, it needs to be bound to the same volume. But what if in the middle of these two operations that are not atomic, another pod gets scheduled on, on that empty slot here. And that can really happen. Like say here, this host has 16 gigs of RAM and there's a new pod that gets created in the meantime with two gigs of RAM. And then when the stateful set controller tries to recreate that pod number one that has been updated, that pod cannot be scheduled on the same host because something else took the empty space. And then you're in sort of really bad situation where you just wanted to upgrade one stateful set, but one of the pods stays pending. So there are several ways you can deal with that. Um, the first thing is to give higher priority to the pods that are of local volume. So you can use this priority class name thing. You can also work with stains and tol toleration to isolate the workloads with local volumes to a particular subset of nodes. So you know other pods are con not gonna be scheduled there. And finally, what I think is the, probably the, the simplest solution to this all is to sort of plan for your workload in advance. So either you know a node is gonna be completely dedicated to a particular pod with a single local volume, either that host can hold several pods with local volumes, but then you use a fixed ratio between RAM and storage so that you know that, uh, for example, if all the storage is occupied, then no new pod can be scheduled because the RAM is sort of reserved for that storage, right? So you can schedule a pod with 10 gigs of RAM um, while another one is being recreated because there's not the available storage to schedule something with 10 gigs of RAM. And that's a way to avoid that problem altogether. One other important thing is the awareness of storage capacity in Kubernetes. And so, when you use dynamic provisioning, for example, it's possible that a pod gets scheduled onto a node that doesn't have the necessary storage space available. Fortunately, this has been fixed starting Kubernetes 1.21, right? And before that version, one way to deal with that again is to have this fixed ratio between RAM and storage. So you know that if the pod can be scheduled because of its RAM, it means the storage is also available. And finally, Another maybe concern is that um, there's no enforcement that um, you get the exact volume of the size you requested. Kubernetes is going to do its best trying to match the claim size with the volume size. But it can happen that, for example, you, you request a one gigabyte claim and the only available volume is one terabyte. And Kubernetes is going to do the match here. And a larger problem is that the scheduler sort of ignores this uh, priority over the closest possible size of the volume across the different nodes. So the scheduler could pick a node that is not the best pick because there are other nodes with um, closest volume size available. And again, this is gonna be fixed in, in new versions of Kubernetes starting alpha in 1.21. All right, I hope that with this presentation, you got a, a bit more intimate knowledge of how local volumes work, and especially um, the things you need to pay attention to if you decide to use them in production. And likely 
those involve a bit more work and a bit more thinking than what you'd have to do if you were using network attached problems. Thank you for attending. <laughs>